St. John has a sense of humor, I think. To say, we are descendants of Abraham, we've never been slaves of anyone, that's a joke. Jewish history is defined by captivity. Slavery in Egypt, exile in Babylon, and except for about 50 years as an independent state under the Maccabees, a whole parade of foreign rulers. So I think St. John throws this joke in here to make us laugh at ourselves a little bit, right? Because it's plainly ridiculous for Jews to say we've never been slaves to anybody, but John's point is that it's equally ridiculous for us to say it. We are just as convinced of that truth as the folks who were talking to Jesus, but we're also just as wrong. It doesn't just have to do with sin, as Jesus says, but with lots of things. One of the reasons we read this text today on Reformation Sunday is that it reminds us of our, uh, it reminds us of our freedom from that legalistic attitude of the medieval Catholic Church. The idea that we can only be saved by obeying God's list of rules. And it's really easy for us as 21st century American Lutherans to cast aspersions on Pope Leo and the Catholic Church of the 16th century. But it's helpful for us to remember that the church didn't intend to be corrupt. It was not the malicious leadership of terrible people that created that system, but the earnest, genuine, well-meaning desire to be nearer to God to bring about God's kingdom on earth. The Pope and the church cultivated that legalism as a means to encourage people to lead godly lives. What Luther and his colleagues realized is that instead of freeing people from sin and evil, that legalism simply imposed a different sort of captivity. The confounding thing is that even while captivity is stifling, it can also be so very comforting. We take strength and pride from our traditions. Having a familiar pattern to follow gives us confidence. It becomes hard for us to tell when the systems and the institutions that we have built to protect ourselves start becoming more harmful than helpful. The Reformation is just one example among many of the ongoing human struggle to reshape our institutions as we grow beyond them. That struggle continues today. We see it playing out now in our federal government, in our immigration policy, in race and gender relations, and in many other places in our lives. In the church, that struggle takes the shape of a general rejection of organized religion in favor of a personalized kind of spirituality. More people feel captive to the system as it exists and seek to gain freedom from it. And so those of us in the church find ourselves standing with those medieval Catholics and those Jews in John's gospel saying, what do you mean we'll be made free? We've never been slaves to anyone. And it sounds just as silly when we say it. Lutherans can sometimes be the worst about this because we claim to enjoy liberation from religious legalism, but we are unable to see how tightly we are bound to a specific tradition. In spite of the fact that a growing number of Lutherans in North America are no longer from Scandinavian or German backgrounds, in many congregations, Lutheranism remains synonymous with Oktoberfest or Ludafisk. <laughs> Our denomination, our Evangelical Lutheran Church in America is 98% white. The African Methodist Episcopal Church is 94% black. The AME Church is more diverse than the Lutheran Church. Whether we realize it or not, Lutheranism in America is held captive to Northern European identity and to whiteness. My point is that St. John's punchline is intended not only to make us laugh, but also perhaps to make us look at ourselves in the mirror and to realize that there are many things we may be holding on to that are holding us captive that we may not even see. It may be that our imaginations are captive to the way we've always done things or to that experience of church, excuse me, that our experience of church is captive to certain 
cultural or racial stereotypes that we don't even recognize. Now in this season of COVID, we are also given to reflect on how our idea of church is captive to a pre-pandemic way of being that doesn't exist anymore. We are just as enslaved as we've ever been, just as in need of freedom as those poor, oblivious people in St. John's story. So how can we free ourselves from those things that bind us? How do we stop celebrating a 500-year-old monk and actually keep reforming the church and ourselves? The answer is that we can't. We confess that we are captive to these things and cannot free ourselves. The solution, Jesus says, lies in knowing the truth. That the truth will make us free. But to paraphrase Pilate, what is that truth? When we read this story, the word that most catches our attention, I think, is maybe freedom. But I think the real key to this story lies in another word, one that is most often obscured by our English translations. It's a word that's sprinkled liberally throughout St. John's Gospel, a theme that runs like a red thread through his entire narrative. And that word is abide. Actually, there are lots of ways to render that word in English. Abide, or dwell, or continue, or remain, or belong, or endure. They're all translations of the same Greek word that St. John uses over and over and over again. You've heard it in lots of places throughout John's Gospel. At Jesus' baptism, John sees the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. It abided with him. Jesus says, Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures or abides to eternal life. And he says, Those who eat my, fr my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. And... In my Father's house, there are many rooms or abiding places. He says, abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. The word is used on many levels. It often literally means where a person is or where they're staying, but it also has the sense of intimacy, of connection and belonging and enduring. In today's story, it shows up when Jesus says, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples. And again, a slave does not abide in the house, but the son abides there forever. Truth, then, is not a doctrine to be believed, or a tradition to follow, or a set of rules to obey. We like to reduce truth to those things because it's easier that way. We think that if we can believe the correct thing, or do the correct thing, or belong to the correct thing, then we'll be free from fear, free from death, free from condemnation. Instead, faith is not about obedience to a law or a doctrine. It's not about the claiming of an identity, like being a descendant of Abraham or a theological descendant of Martin Luther. Freedom doesn't come through obedience or service. It comes through relationship. The truth Jesus wants us to know isn't a fact, but a person. He wants to abide in us and for us to abide in him. St. Paul says the same thing with different words when he writes that we are saved by the faithfulness of Christ rather than by our own works. Another translation that's often obscured in English where ours say faith in Christ. It's what Jeremiah imagines when he says that God will write the law in our hearts. We mostly think of freedom as a state of being unhindered by people or other considerations. But Jesus says that freedom is not the ability to escape the house, but rather the ability 
to abide there, to become a part of the family. Families are bound together by love and concern for one another. We bicker and disagree, but at the end of the day, we are still one. Being bound to God and to one another is how Jesus offers us this freedom. Legalism, like the legalism of the medieval Catholic Church, is kind of a quick and dirty way to approximate relationship. It's like an instruction manual for relationship. We like it because it's easy for us to adhere to a list of expectations and because even the gospel message of saved by grace through faith often becomes just another form of legalism in the sense that we derive from it a command to believe certain things about God in order to be saved. We prefer laws written on stone tablets because we can more easily see them. What God offers us something much more freeing and much more difficult. Instead of writing the truth on tablets of stone for us to read and follow, God writes the truth on our hearts. Jesus comes not to teach us to, obedient, to be obedient, but to trust, to have faith. He comes not to give us a set of rules to follow, but an experience of the overwhelming love of God. Love that, cannot, that we cannot help but be changed by when we've encountered it. Freedom comes not from following laws or memorizing proverbs, but from being invited into God's house and abiding as a part of God's family. That's what we celebrate today. What we celebrate every day that we gather as we come around this table and this font, we lift our voices in song and praise. We celebrate that God in Christ abides with us and that we abide with God and with one another. The law of love has been written in our hearts. We love because God first loved us. That is our salvation. Not that we're so great at it, but that God did it first. And because God did it first, that's what makes us capable of it. We have grace not because of what we believe or do or what we are or where we come from, but only because God chooses to give it. It has nothing to do with who we are and everything to do with who God is. God washes us. God feeds us. God loves us. And that love frees us to abide with God and with one another in God's name forever. To endure or abide to eternal life. That's the freedom we celebrate today. Not the freedom that liberates us from all obligations, but the freedom of God which binds us together in love, which gives us an opportunity to look out for one another. The opportunity to abide with God and with each other. This is the freedom that makes us one, which allows us to serve one another and care for each other, knowing that God's family always has our back and that we have theirs. This is the freedom of the cross.